Good afternoon. I'm Cecilia hey, Rouse, and I'm Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. I'm delighted to, intro to introduce the panel and to welcome you uh, to this panel that we've been eagerly awaiting on Wilson. So among historians, Woodrow Wilson is consistently ranked as one of the country's great presidents. Noted for his successful domestic legislative agenda in his first term and international achievements in his second, Wilson is honored nationally and here at Princeton, where many, many entities bear his name. But Wilson was a highly divisive figure in his time. He alienated many while denying others the fullness of their humanity on racial grounds. Under his watch, Princeton University remained a bastion of white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism, and as United States President, he segregated the federal civil service, closing one of the few pathways to African-American advancement. Today, we welcome a distinguished panel of guests to discuss Wilson's legacy on race. Through our discussion, we hope to paint a more complete picture of Wilson than is often seen. So I will first introduce, actually I'm gonna to try to do this in order. Uh, first, uh, Chad Williams, who received his PhD from Princeton in 2004, and he joins us from the Department of African and African American Studies at Brandeis University, where he is associate professor and chair of the department. He is author of the book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in the World War I Era. We also have Eric Yellen, who earned his PhD from Princeton as well in 2007. He is an associate professor of history and American studies at the University of Richmond and author of the book, Racism, Racism in the Nation's Service, Government Workers and the Color Line in Woodrow Wilson's America. We also have Ashley Lawrence Sanders, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Rutgers University. She studies American politics and political activism, as well as the role of women in politics. And finally, we welcome A. Scott Berg from the great class of 1971. Scott is a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer and author of the book, Wilson. Following today's discussion, please join us downstairs in the Bernstein Gallery for a new exhibit that opened this week in the nation's service, question mark, Woodrow Wilson Revisited. And now I will turn things over to the panel. Chad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Rouse, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon, uh, obviously a very uh, important uh, and in timely discussion. Uh, I have to admit that I uh, approach this conversation uh, with some personal uh, sensibilities, uh, having received my PhD from uh, Princeton uh, University uh, with my work focusing on African-American soldiers uh, in some ways uh, deeply rooted uh, in the legacy of Woodrow Wilson, the title of my book, Torchbearers of Democracy itself, drawn from Woodrow Wilson's uh, war declaration speech in uh, April of 1917. Uh, uh, but uh, also having walked this campus um, not that long ago, not that old, um, <laughs> and experiencing the, the dissonance uh, that I think animated the student protests here um, of being at Princeton, but not being of Princeton, um, of being at a truly remarkable uh, institution, but also realizing that one of its main historical figures uh, probably would not have envisioned much of a place for me here at this university. Uh, so having this uh, conversation uh, is, is very important, uh, it's, it's essential, uh, and really speaks to much more about Woodrow Wilson. Um, we can certainly spend a lot of time talking about Woodrow Wilson, uh, the individual, uh, of talking about the things that he accomplished, um, also uh, talking about the ways uh, in which he was deeply flawed. Um, but there's a bigger conversation to be had. Uh, and that conversation is about how we think about history uh, and how we think about the place of black people uh, in this country's history. Um, whenever I engage in these kind of big moral, philosophical, historical questions, there's usually three people that I kind of turn to. Uh, one is W.B. Du Bois, um, and hopefully his name comes up in our discussion. Uh, the second is Toni Morrison, uh, Princeton's own, uh, and the third is James Baldwin. Uh, and James Baldwin uh, famously said, and I want to make sure I get the, the quote right, that American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible 
than anything anyone has ever said about it. And I think, in many ways, that speaks directly to Woodrow Wilson himself. Right? There's a understanding of Wilson that is embraced by many people, many historians, that is truly beautiful, right? That he kind of embodies the best of America, uh, the exceptional nature of the American democratic experiment, the possibilities of American democracy, right? These beautiful things, ideals that we hold on to. Uh, but at the same time, there is much that is truly terrible about Wilson. When we think about his record uh, when it comes to race and specifically uh, African Americans, there is true terror there that we need to, to grapple with, that we need to reckon with. Right? It's one thing to revisit Wilson, to recognize Wilson and his record when it comes to, to race, but I think it's something more profound and urgent to, to reckon with, with what that means. So I'm, I'm interested in how we, we reckon with Wilson, um, but more so how we reckon with the history that Wilson is a part of. How do we reckon with the history of the time period, the Wilson era, you know, which was one of the most devastating periods in this country's history as far as African American rights, the nadir, uh, as historian Rayford Logan uh, termed it. How do we reckon with the legacies of racial violence, disenfranchisement, systematic exclusion from the promise of the nation's democracy. Right? So that history is still with us today. Right? So it's one thing to engage in a conversation, uh, to have a very important exhibit, uh, to issue uh, recommendations from an esteemed uh, committee, um, but I think we need to ask ourselves, is that enough? Uh, is that truly reckoning with the history, the legacy of what Wilson stood for, what he uh, represented? Uh, so I could certainly say a lot more. We were only given five minutes to, to talk, <laughs> which is totally unfair. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll certainly pass the, the mic over to my esteemed uh, panelists. So, thank you. Thanks. Um, I guess we'll have more time for questions. And so I'll, I'm just going to say a little bit about what happens when we don't reckon with the, the history, talk a little bit about the history and then what, what I think it means for, for, for doing the kind of work Chad's asking us to do. Um, I came to my project on, on Woodrow Wilson's administration because there was a line in a textbook that Woodrow Wilson segregated the federal government. So historians knew this. Um, you should still buy my book. But, um, <laughs> Mine too. Right. But, and his too. <laughs> Um, but I didn't know what that meant, right? What does that mean, <coughs> segregate? Does that mean that there were African Americans working in the federal government? Does that mean that it wasn't segregated before? 1913 is actually late, if you know something about history, for, for the arrival of segregation. What, and what ultimately, and this is the part that I think gets to the question of, of reckoning, what did it mean in the lives of the people who were segregated? What does it mean to have a color line drawn across your work life, your career, your city, your, your workplace. And those questions we, we, we weren't dealing with, and, and, and there's an opportunity for a dissertation. Um, and so one of the things I quickly learned is that we tend to put this in the category of a kind of spatial organization, that what Wilson did was put black people over here and white people over here, which people were doing, white people were doing all across the country at the same time. So Wilson is sort of an ordinary racist. And as the problem is that, um, we don't build buildings to ordinary racists. Um, you know, John Smith, racist, here's his building. We, we build buildings to presidents and to, and to famous leaders. And so we have to figure out what, why does this matter? What's unordinary about this? And the first thing that's unordinary is that Washington, D.C. was not an ordinary community. What the Wilson administration did was not merely separate people. It declared war on a, the nation's most important and prominent and um, rising black middle class community in the country. And that attack came through not just moving people around offices, but in the ending of careers, in the changing of, of workplaces in which it was impossible to be a dignified human being and work. And in a way, taking the nation's work, the nation's service, and saying that African Americans are not worthy of it, right? And they're not worthy of being not just um, 
allowed in the office, but not compensated in the same way, not promoted in the same way, not um, uh, uh, allowed to achieve in those offices in the way that other Americans are. And that's, that's a bigger story than lockers down, down the middle of a room. The second bigger story is Wilson claimed to be a progressive. He ran um, in 1912. He said that he had the best of hopes for everyone, including African Americans. Um, so he had to justify this, the, his administration's actions. And that's where I think we get a, a, an even bigger problem. Because ju Wilson's justification was that this is um, what the nation needs. This is what is progressive. This is what is um, in the best interests of all Americans is for African Americans to be separated out because they're a problem, right? And if they're, if they're in these offices, if they're in the nation's service, then they're going to create friction that makes the possibility of the harmonious, efficient state that progressives were seeking to build, they were going to make that impossible. Mm -hmm. And that's a progressive, bureaucratic justification that, uh, I, that we can see again and again and again. Right? That it's not, I, it allows Wilson or, or McAdoo or Burleson or any of his lieutenants to say, I personally don't have a problem with black people. But gee, what are we going to do you know, with these offices? And what are we going to do? And then we get things like the redneck myth that it's actually poor white people who are the problem. Poor white people are not president of the United States, and they weren't president of Princeton. Right? The, the question of whether these, this, is a, this, is a, um, this could ever happen and happen with a, a successful outcome Wilson puts on the table. And it requires an erasure of 30 years of African Americans serving the nation at all levels of the federal government. Right? We, could it happen? Absolutely, it had been happening. African Americans, there were 400 middle class, white collar, black men and women working at all levels of the federal government in 1912. Everything from presidential appointments to clerks, they were with white people working underneath them. And so to get up and claim that we have friction when there's no extent record of white people um, in any broad way objecting to this situation requires writing white people, black people out of the progressive vision. Right? And that's a much bigger problem than you know, Woodrow Wilson personally had fond feeling for black people in his heart. So my own work sort of piggybacks on what Chad and Eric were just talking about, which is this reckoning of history. Um, my own work is in actually historical memory and the ways in which African Americans have contested historical memory for decades. I specifically study Civil War memory, but really the ways that African Americans contend with an unreconstructed nation and a nation which has essentially erased their legacy of emancipation by the time Wilson becomes president. And Wilson perpetuates this throughout his policies, throughout his writings early as a historian about the Reconstruction era, so I'm particularly concerned with two things. When we talk about reckoning with history, what does that really look like? <laughs> I think it looks like the long tradition of protests that we've seen that have continued across college campuses. I cover the ways in which African Americans have protested commemorating different parts of the public landscape from 1865, the first year at, during the end of the war until the 1960s when during the Civil Rights Movement, they particularly leveraged their own memories of the Civil War, what emancipation should have meant to African Americans, and then what it didn't mean in the end. And I think this protest tradition is important for how we think about Wilson, because African Americans did support Wilson's administration. They supported him for president. Um, they were sorely disappointed. I know for a fact that Du Bois supported him, and he used his work as a scholar as one of the reasons why he supported him, despite the fact that his own work as a scholar was part of a long tradition of racist <laughs> history about African Americans' capabilities to actually fully realize <coughs> their own citizenship. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in why we care about Wilson, right? Why do we care about this particular name? One is because we link these things to the very real realities for African Americans on the ground. As we've seen throughout the protests that are happening on college campuses, it's not just about the name, right? It's about what's happening to the individual students who have problems with the fact that this name represents some of the things that they seem wrong with where they are. I noticed in the last summer when Bree Newsom climbed the top of the flagpole and took down the Confederate flag, I knew at that moment this was gonna spark something, and it did. <laughs> I mean, all over the country, you saw in different cities, in different universities, people really starting to question, why is there a statue to Nathan Bedford Forrest in Memphis, 
You know, why is there a statue to Burgar? Why do we, even in New York City where I live, people are questioning why there was a street named after Robert E. Lee. And I think there was an article in the New York Times recently that actually said that this has dissipated in the last few months, that we're not seeing as much discussion about the sort of the nostalgia of like white Southern memory or the questioning of white supremacist being commemorated on the landscape. And I think it's interesting that, you know, we see this as a dissipation and not as sort of the logical step to the next movement. But for African Americans who've long contested these things, for African Americans who complained in the 1960s about the Confederate flag being on top of the state houses, it wasn't just about taking down the flag, it was about what's next. And often in the way that it's covered, we don't talk about what's next. Um, in my work, I try to link what African Americans have done in this long protest tradition to the very real activism on the ground. So while you had the NAACP protesting the birth of the nation film, what did that mean to them on the ground? Why were they so concerned with the movie? Because they knew what this movie was spreading was the actual sort of white supremacy and white nationalism that was dangerous to their lives. So we could talk a bit more about this later, but let me hand this over to Scott. Okay, um, I, have, I have a statement to read. <laughs> <laughs> I am not Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> um, so I am going to say some things on behalf of Woodrow Wilson or the world in which Woodrow Wilson lived, which may not necessarily express how I feel today in 2016. And so just please remember, remember this. I'm going to say some things that Wilson said um, that expressed how he felt, mostly when he was president between 1913 and 1919. Um, a second statement I want to make, and it will mean little to few of you, um, and that is I am a trustee of the university and I was on the committee that was involved in the Wilson legacy, naming or unnaming. I am not appearing here to be a spokesman for either of the trustees um, or for that committee. Um, but here's what the one thing I would like to say as a, about the committee or as a result of that committee, which is I spent countless hours on this campus and at home and reading 650 statements, hearing lots of people testify uh, about Woodrow Wilson before us. And I was uh, often alarmed uh, just to hear a lot of misinformation and when I began to sort things out, it occurred to me that what I've been hearing, not just on this campus, not just the Wilson naming situation, but just Woodrow Wilson in general, just when I read the New York Times and how they talk about Woodrow Wilson, I think there are just some basic uh, misconceptions out there, and I want to get into the race of it all. Um, but there are four or five points I just have to put out there because because everyone says, yes, Woodrow Wilson is a racist, um, people, rather than examining what that means, what is racism, there's been a lot of extrapolation that has gone on. And as a result, I have heard a lot of people say with great authority that Woodrow Wilson was, because he was a racist, he was an anti-Semite, um, which is completely untrue. This is the man who put the first Jew on the Supreme Court. I've heard that Woodrow Wilson was a great misogynist, um, that he really fought for, uh, against women having the vote in this country. This is not true at all, never was. I heard that Woodrow Wilson was anti-Catholic. This isn't true. His primary advisor um, from the time he was in New Jersey uh, was, was a Catholic whom he brought with him. Woodrow Wilson, in essence, and this is, this is what I wanted to get across, and I think this should be a layer of everything we talk about here, and, and my colleagues may disagree with this. <clears throat> I've been reading, well, much of my life, things by and about Woodrow Wilson, but certainly in the last 15 years, hardly a day has started or ended in which I haven't read about Woodrow Wilson, in which I haven't come across anything that puts him across as a hater. I don't think he was one. I don't think he was a bigot. Uh, yes, uh, he was a racist. He did grow up in the Confederate South. Uh, he grew up in the Reconstruction South. And he came to Princeton and to Washington at a time when it was a very different world. And one of the things I try to do in my studies, my writings, 
is to put my characters in the world in which they live. And as I don't have to tell you, but maybe I do, uh, the world of 1913, especially in a southern town such as Washington, D.C., or even Princeton, New Jersey, was a very different place uh, than it is today. I can assure you Woodrow Wilson did not admire, join, or support the Ku Klux Klan. Now, I don't care how many times you read it or I read it in the New York Times. It's not true. Uh, and he writes about this early on in his, in his historical writings. And I think you'll get a very clear sense of how he felt about the Klan, for example. The Birth of a Nation is not a movie he especially liked. He, he was sorry it was made, or more to the point that it was being exhibited, especially, as he said, in places where there were heavily uh, colored populations. Um, the, the, great, the greatest movie um, blurb that has ever been written, it's like writing history with lightning, is something Woodrow Wilson never said. It's just been put out there. It's part of the mythology, and so it goes. So there are the two big charges, however. Well, not, as part of the committee, we dealt with two big charges, how to deal with Woodrow Wilson and his race on this campus and then in the nation world at large when he was president of the United States. Um, the first thing is about his segregating Princeton, his barring of blacks. Um, on this campus, and I think it warrants at least um, a word or two, which is to say this, that this campus existed for 160 years before the campus had to deal with an African American. <coughs> it was in Woodrow Wilson's penultimate year, in 19, 1908 or 1909, that Wilson received a letter from a poor colored student in the South, I believe that was his phraseology, the student's phraseology, asking if he could enroll at Princeton. Uh, Woodrow Wilson did not write back, in fact I might suggest that he was hiding behind somebody else, his secretary writing back for him, but he wrote or instructed the secretary to write back that it would not be advisable for him to come to this campus, which was heavily Southern. It had long been heavily Southern. Wilson knew what these Southern boys would, were like. He had seen Southern boy behavior on this campus. He knew what happened when a black even walked on campus. There were some episodes in a locker room, in a lecture hall. There were black theological uh, students here in town that if they showed up to a lecture, sometimes whites would get it out. And I think when Wilson said to this student, you would not have a good time here, you would not be welcome here, it's advisable you don't go here. I don't think he was saying, I'm against blacks being educated. I think he felt life would be pretty awful uh, for a student on this campus. I, I would imagine that he imagined um, what the safety would be like for this student and if he would get through a day or a year. So as a result of that, that has now been blown up in Wilson basically barred blacks from applying to Princeton. Uh, just uh, parenthetically, uh, because I've heard this at least a half dozen times in the last six months, he did not tell the great Paul Robeson that he could not attend Princeton University. Um, <clears throat> Paul Robeson did live in town here. Uh, Paul Robeson, first of all, was not the great Paul Robeson um, then, uh, but second of all, um, Wilson left this college. Paul Robeson would have been nine years old at that time. As for what happened in Washington, D.C., the segregation, the resegregation, however one looks at what happened uh, in Washington, um, and we will get deep into, um, into these uh, woods, I'm sure, but there are two points that are often left out in the argument of what Wilson did when he allowed, and again, he has to take full blame for this, but he did hide behind his, uh, his postmaster general <coughs> and his secretary of the treasury, uh, both of whom were really active, southern, bigoted segregationists. Wilson, I don't think, was in the same camp. Did he appoint them? Yes, he did. But this is going to make another point I'm gonna, I hope we can get into a little later on, too. 
um, which is being a segregationist was not a huge issue for most people in this country at that time. But here are the two points I wanted to make that seldom have come up or I've seldom heard in the segregation slash resegregation of Washington, D.C. The first is that when Woodrow Wilson was president-elect, a great contingent of people, actually a steady flow of mostly Southern uh, congressmen and a few senators, came to Wilson and basically said, sir, you have come to town here with a very bold, aggressive, progressive agenda, and you are going to get nothing passed. Indeed, nothing of this new freedom, nothing of the modern income tax, getting rid of the old tariffs, uh, the Federal Reserve System, the 40-hour work week, child labor laws. None of that is going to happen if, indeed, you continue or allow this integration of the government. The second point uh, is, and this few people realize, and you really have to go through a lot of Woodrow Wilson's papers to see it, but there were many more people urging Woodrow Wilson to keep this country segregated than they were urging him to integrate it. And I contend, and I, I'd like everyone at least to consider, and this is not an excuse for him, but to consider that Woodrow Wilson, I believe, was genuinely a centrist in his day, in 1913. In 1913, when the Chief Justice of the United States used to claim rather proudly that he rode with the Klan, when numerous members of the Congress, of the Senate, were proud members of the Ku Klux Klan. This was not something they had to hide. This was a way in which they got elected, uh, in which the law of the land was still Plessy versus Ferguson. It's not some law that had gone back, uh, you know, a hundred years. This was still a pretty fresh decision. It was not even 20 years old when Woodrow Wilson was president. And there was also the great voice of Booker T. Washington still resounding in this country, who spoke, I believe, and I stand to be corrected, uh, for a majority of black people. And it was he who was a, a asking for great accommodationism uh, at this time. Um, and that separate but equal was a way to go on. So I will add one other point, and then we will open it up, because I'm, I'm sure I've gone way over. Um, but it is this. Woodrow Wilson, and he was a racist, and we can discuss what that means, too. But during his presidency, Wilson kept the race conversation going. This is not somebody who, well, first of all, you know, he did have these people from Congress who came to him and said, we want all black people out of the government. So when I say he was a centrist, and Wilson, and it's, it's horrible, it's disgusting that hundreds of people were either fired or demoted. So they wondered, well, why doesn't Wilson just fire them all? Why doesn't Wilson stop putting some black judges on benches? Why does he continue to hire black postmasters? But Wilson did. He did, and I think that was his way of honoring a pledge he had made when he courted the black vote in 1912 and won it. Uh, indeed, they learned by 1916 because he really didn't pull through on it. But the fact remains that he kept a conversation going. He had black leaders in and out of the Oval Office throughout his two terms in the White House. And that's why we're here today, because that conversation <coughs> is still going on. And now, I throw it open to whom? Do we, do we <laughs> self-moderate? Yes. Who wants to go first? Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got your hand up. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have lots of points, but I want to make sure that people get to ask their questions. But I, I want to make a couple of points. Um, one is the idea that um, everybody's a segregation, and segregation is, is standard, and, and so by standing up and saying segregation is, is, is where we should go, he's, Wilson's a moderate. And the problem with that is that Washington, D.C. wasn't segregated. And why wasn't it segregated? Because it's under control of the federal government. Federal government, Congress, has to decide whether to, to 
segregate trains, whether to segregate public accommodations, whether to segregate federal offices. And this debate had been going in Congress for two decades by the time Wilson arrived. And Congress never acted to segregate Washington, D.C. because there were always enough northern or, well, northern Republicans in Congress who said, no, that's not what we do. So it's simply not true that it's standard in 1913 to assume that the nation is segregated. Now, was the South segregated? Absolutely, but the South is not wholly the nation, except that Wilson wanted it to be, but that's a different story. <laughs> the second thing is that the idea that um, Wilson would be truly a racist if he had simply fired everybody, first of all, misunderstands his role in this. And, and this, I agree with Scott, that Wilson's day-to-day -day involvement in this is, is, is he's just not on a day-to-day -day basis involved. He hands this, the question of African Americans in the civil service to his lieutenants, to these far more active racists like McAdoo and Burleson and, and Josephus Daniels and other uh, cabinet members. But the reason they don't simply fire all the black people is because black people are useful. And white Southerners know this better than anybody else, that black people in the South do the work. And so what the Wilson administration does is it says, we're going to have African Americans. And I, and I have letters from um, directors in offices. Not, this is not just in the cabinet level, saying, we have to have African Americans, because that's who cleans up. That's who does the unskilled labor. And we need them to do that. We can't fire them all. We're not going to let them go any higher, because we don't want them there. Right? African Americans were, the, the problem with segregation is that we imagine that it's exclusion. It's not exclusion. It's the, the great problem of segregation is how do you make people feel less and then available for work? Right? Um, and the third piece that, that I'll say, and then I'll, I'll shut up, um, is, is the question of what does it mean to, to assess someone's legacy? Mm -hmm. I, I would contend that you, I don't really know exactly what Wilson felt in his heart, and I'm willing to accept that Wilson, Wilson had the best of intentions for everyone. But that's not what historians mean by legacy. What historians mean by legacy is what did it mean for, what did his presidency mean for Americans? <laughs> what his presidency meant for African Americans was devastation, was an endorsement of not just segregation, but of absolute um, a capping on what their life's promise was, and then ultimately by 1919, an acceptance of violence and terror and killing. And those are legacies that, that, ever, that are, to a historian, critical and really go well beyond what was in his heart. So, um, oh boy, where to, where to, where to jump in here? Um, <laughs> Sorry. I, I think when we, when we talk about the race question during this, this time, as, as it was termed, um, you know, the, the Negro question or the Negro problem. Yes, there, there was a, a conversation happening. Um, but it was Ida B. Wells who was driving that conversation. It was W.B. Du Bois who was driving that conversation. It was the Chicago Defender and other black newspapers driving that conversation. Um, it was a burgeoning civil rights movement uh, that was forcing Wilson to have meetings in the White House with William Monroe Trotter uh, and others who brought the race question uh, to him and insisted that he be president of the United States, that he be president of a country that included 10 million African American citizens. And I think that's critical to, to how we assess Wilson's, Wilson's legacy and the history of this period. How, how are we talking about American history? How are we talking about the nation? In what ways do we include and exclude African Americans from our understanding of the history of this period and how we define the nation itself? Right. African Americans saw themselves as citizens um, and expected Woodrow Wilson to respond to their needs as citizens. Uh, and that manifested itself in a number of different ways. I study World War I, uh, which was a moment of remarkable political activism, consciousness 
on the part of African Americans of their place in the country as citizens, the obligations, the mutual, reciprocal obligations um, of citizenship. So uh, I think we, we see how the, the race question, as it was termed at the time, uh, was something that African Americans you know, were, were deeply engaged in, but also moving beyond seeing themselves as, as a problem. And this is, I think, where, where we need to kind of really step back in and engage this idea of Wilson being a racist, and, and more pointedly, Wilson being a white supremacist. What, what does that mean? Right? Yes, he wasn't a member of the Ku Klux Klan. No, he didn't participate in any lynchings. But he was a white supremacist nevertheless. Right? There were various gradations um, of white supremacy uh, in the United States at this time. Uh, and he adhered to a particular white supremacist conception of the nation that did not include African Americans as full and equal citizens, and oftentimes not as full human beings. Okay, when we think about, as Eric was alluding to, just the sheer violence of this period, which encompassed Woodrow Wilson's presidency, the East St. Louis racial massacre, pogrom, right? Really hundreds of African Americans you know, being killed, slaughtered, right? Babies being thrown into burning buildings, okay? What does Woodrow Wilson do? Right? Would he have responded differently if it was a different community who had that type of terror inflicted upon them? Right? He was aghast at what happened, but if you see black people as worthy human beings, how do you, how do you respond? Right? And I think we could point to a number of different examples of that. So again, this isn't to, to get into you know, whether Woodrow Wilson was a good guy, a bad guy, whether he, he hated or not, uh, I think it's important to, to recognize you know, the, the context of the times and how devastating that, that context uh, truly was for, for many African Americans. Um, I just wanna add quickly too, when we talk about this idea about African Americans and citizenship, that Wilson's own views on this sort of reveal what he thinks about African Americans in sort of this racial paternalistic way, right? Like we don't want African Americans to come to Princeton because, well, it's gonna be too difficult for them, right? African Americans were unprepared for freedom because you know they were just happy during slavery because they were dependent on their very faithful masters. Like these are things that he actually said about African Americans during this period and during slavery. So this all goes back to this idea of not seeing African Americans as full citizens and actually not one of his constituents. Um, because when Scott was talking earlier, he was saying that, uh, that Wilson got all of these letters from people who were so pro-segregation. I immediately thought, letters from who? You know, you know, who's the constituency that he's really paying attention to? Is it the whole of the United States? It was clear it was not. He thought African Americans were not prepared to be voters, to be political leaders, <laughs> and he clearly did not take them into consideration as being full citizens in this country. So when we talk about the ways that we think about Wilson and race and his legacy as a white supremacist, we need to think about the ways in which his type of racism, and it's like you know Chad says, there's, there's levels to this, right? Because Wilson wasn't a Vardaman, you know, he wasn't this like virulent caricature of a racist, we somehow want to then excuse the real legacy and the damage that his policies did. So when we say that he was a racist, this goes back to Scott's point, we need to think about what does that mean? Why do we have this one image of a racist? <laughs> you know, why is it this like caricature that we've put out there so that we don't see the realities of systemic racism? I would, I would say, I think Wilson thought he was thinking of the whole of the United States. That is to say, Wilson was the first president elected from the South after the Civil War. And it was perceived as a great reunion. This was really considered the first real reuniting of all the states when a Southerner ended up in the White House. So, I mean, listen, again, I'm not Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> um, but to do the math here, you say, okay, I've got 100 million people, 90 million of them are whites. Um, of 
certainly of the Southerners, they're perfectly fine with segregation. It's not really on their list. Which Southerners? What, what <laughs> yeah. The yeah. white Southerners. I'd almost the, half the of the South. The great majority <laughs> of them. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, let's, well, let's, there are 90 million whites, basically, in this country. And for those people, and of the African Americans, to do more of Woodrow Wilson's math, uh, a great number of them, well, they were okay, especially the older African Americans. You said, so, you, I think you hit the key thing, Eric, the, the um, adjective, you said there was a burgeoning civil rights movement. And I think that's right. I think it was burgeoning in 1913. And I think this is why a Booker T. Washington still had some sway. And you know, one of the reasons I, one of many reasons, but one of the reasons I think this movement really takes off, say around 1915, is because Booker T. Washington died. And it's a, it's a generational thing that was, that was beginning to change in this country for African Americans. Um, was the whole country a segregated place? Uh, no, but, um, I mean, we, well, let me put it this way. In Princeton, New Jersey, uh, Paul Robeson went to a segregated school. Um, and I don't mean Princeton. I mean the, the high school he went to was an all-black school. And that was in a northern enlightened town in, um, you know, here we are in, in, in this very town. Um, I would say this above all, and this, you know, this is an easy overlay to put on Wilson and his thoughts. I think, I think he knew very well once he got into office. Race was going to have to be dealt with. I think he wanted more than anything else that it wouldn't be on his watch. Uh, and I think that was largely because he was so beholden to the politics of Southerners. And also, let's face it, he was a Southerner. Um, I think he was more enlightened than most Southerners, but at the end of the day, I think the issue of segregation of civil rights for African Americans, I think it was very much on his mind. I think it was very much in his heart, but I don't think it was really on his agenda. And all I could say in his defense on this matter is, if you look at the Democrat, Democratic platform in 1912, which Wilson ran on, you will see not a word about civil rights. If you look at the great platform of the great party of Lincoln, the Republican Party, you will see not a word about civil rights in 1912. If you go to the progressives and Teddy Roosevelt, again, not a word, and he who actively courted the blacks as Wilson had, but then when the progressives held their convention, one of the blacks kept out. Even the great socialist, Eugene Debs, you know, you would think, well, we're all workers, we're all brothers here. Eugene Debs told the same darky jokes that Woodrow Wilson told. So that's 1912. Okay, fool me once, shame on me. Uh, or shame on you, whoever gets shamed. But, in, <laughs> but in, in 1916, when Woodrow Wilson had basically segregated, resegregated Washington, and this, of course, had national implications. If they can do it in Washington, we can do it anywhere in the country. Um, and I'm sure Wilson recognized that. But the 1916 platform, the Democrats didn't change a word. The 1916 Republican platform, it's not as if they said, oh my God, those terrible Democrats, look what Woodrow Wilson did. Look what he did to Washington, D.C. That's a terrible thing. Not a word in that platform about civil rights or helping African Americans. Go to 1920, 24, 28, 32. You can keep going up until the 40s. So again, I'm not trying to justify him, but I'm trying to contextualize him. I'm trying to give you a sense of what this country was. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think that this was an issue for most Americans. It was the issue, the only issue, the, most, the issue they could get most passionate about uh, for a, a growing sector of African Americans and increasingly enlightened white Americans. But this is, uh, it's a, it was a different country. Okay. Jump on this one. So, oh, uh, 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 time for questions, and it's already 5.25. Um, and while we do uh, a microphone switch, I'm going to take a moment.
before we open it up for questions, and I'm going to do my obnoxious students first, <laughs> but I really want to make sure I have time to thank everybody who helped put together the, Bernstein, the exhibit that we have down in Bernstein Gallery, which we hope you will all visit after this panel. So there are a number of thank yous that are in order. First, for the amazing research and profound text, I want to thank the team from Mud Library, Dan Link, Sarah Logue, Jared Drake, Alexis Entroli, and did I get that right? Entroli, Entroli, <laughs> thank you, Entroli. Um, so I want to thank them for their amazing research. For his terrific editing and wordsmithing, John Wareham from Princeton Writes. For their incredible design, David Lackney and Taryn Baker from Whirlwind Creative. For keeping the trains running on time, Elizabeth Donahue of the Woodrow Wilson School. For the audio and other technical elements of which we are very proud, uh, Brian Blount from Otis, Wells Packard from Whirlwind, and Kathy Cuff, Rose Huber, Keith Moulton, Bonalise Rosado from the Woodrow Wilson School. If I've left anyone out, my apologies, but as you can see, it really does take a village to mount an exhibit which was mounted in 10 <laughs> weeks. So I'd like to have us all to give a big round of applause. So I think we have a microphone. So we have two microphones here. Again, students first, um, and we have time for questions. Oh, come on. Don't do do it. Do it. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, sir. Scott. Scott, uh, as Scott um, mentioned, I think it was a very good point that um, after Woodrow Wilson segregated D.C. and the federal government, that no uh, presidential candidate, no even like opposition uh, candidate considered, um, you know, in, uh, reintegrating it. And I think that it's important to focus on not just what Woodrow Wilson did during his time, but the legacy that it had um, on, you know, black civil rights and the advancement of blacks in America in the next uh, decades. And I'd like you all to kind of answer, uh, talk about that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, as I mentioned, one of the things that Wilson does, and he doesn't do it entirely on his own, but he's, he's a kind of an important guy, um, is that he gives language for not doing something. So one of the really remarkable um, uh, um, aspects of this record is that the, la the language of friction, the language of, of African Americans as a problem in workplaces proliferates in um, Memos within the Republican Party, within within um, administrators, at long after Wilson, and that's to me it has to be accounted as part of the legacy of the Wilson administration. Because prior to that, you don't see that language nearly as often. You know, the um, federal forms didn't ask for a person's color or race until 1904. Prior to that, there w there was not a language for thinking about segregation. This is why I don't like resegregation. Um, you know, the 1904 and 1908 Republican platforms actually did say something about civil rights. So what we're talking about is not a static wait till, you know, students sit in in 1960 and everything will, will change. What we're talking about is an attack on a movement that was already existing. It, it happened when, when African Americans participated in their freedom at the end of the Civil War, right? And that, that's a, a chaotic period that gets settled in this period by powerful people like Woodrow Wilson. Well, just, just briefly, I think that I mean, historians have been debating for a number of years the, the beginning points of the modern civil rights movement. I know this is a debate about a, a long civil rights movement, you know, possibly even going back to the, the end of the Civil War. Um, but I would argue that you know, Woodrow Wilson's years in office, and specifically uh, the years of the First World War, were absolutely critical uh, in shaping the course of the civil rights movement, and part of that has to do with Woodrow Wilson's failures uh, to address the concerns uh, facing uh, African Americans. Um, the, uh, the lack of inclusion uh, that he had uh, as far as imagining what democracy meant um, when it came to uh, African Americans. Uh, his uh, neglect uh, of the racial terror that black people uh, faced uh, in 1917, especially in 1919 after uh, the war, the, the Red Summer, where race riots erupted um, all over the country, including in Washington, uh, D.C. Um, those moments uh, were galvanizing for 
African Americans all over the country, uh, north and south, from a wide variety of different ideological uh, persuasions. Uh, and I think they recognized in Woodrow Wilson, um, and specifically uh, what Woodrow Wilson espoused as far as his vision of the nation, uh, something that was fundamentally wrong uh, and that had to be addressed through sustained activism, protest, radical agitation. Uh, and in some ways, maybe we should be thanking Richard Wilson for creating the, the modern uh, civil rights movement. But um, I think at the time, um, we need to recognize how pointedly critical African Americans were of, of Wilson and his policies and how that then translated into many of the civil rights um, gains that we, we recognize today. I was just gonna jump in on one, one or two points about what, what Chad just said. I do think Wilson imagined inclusion. I just don't think he imagined it between 1913 and 1920. He often talked about inclusion, but it was gonna be way out there. At a point, and I think, again, doing his math, I think he figured, and this was the case, in his administration, there were still many people who had fought in the Civil War. There were still many people refighting the Civil War, certainly in the South, and I think many people who thought, well, by God, if we keep fighting this social war, maybe, maybe we can go back to it. So that was going on, and I think Again, Wilson, I think, just wanted to get through this and really didn't want to deal uh, with it. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, just really quickly, I mean, w Wilson was a nationalist, right? So he sort of saw his election, as you said earlier, as this union of the nation. But in reality, you know, as my own work has pointed out, the union of the nation was between the white South and the white North. So once again, we see this way in which African Americans own freedom and citizenship is left out. Now we can talk about Wilson having this distant future of where African Americans can participate at a full level in government, but you know, what does that look like for a population of people who haven't had the opportunity? So, I mean, we're not seeing like Wilson, the reasonable pragmatist, really putting this into practice in the same ways in which he apparently thought about it. Uh, uh, listen, yeah. And I would just say, I think for me, the blackest mark against Woodrow Wilson in his eight years as President of the United States was what Chad was referring to, which was after the war in which tens of thousands of African Americans fought. They went over there, black mothers sent their sons over there, a lot of them didn't come back, a lot came back really destroyed. And I, I mean, as I was doing research, kept thinking, oh God, this is the, the ultimate teaching moment that Woodrow Wilson, professor in chief, could have had with the United States and said, you know what? All the soldiers have come home, blacks and whites, families have suffered just the same. This is now the moment to open up this country. Would have been a golden opportunity. And he did nothing on that matter. And that, I think, to me, that is the, as I said, that's, that's the biggest thing to be held against Woodrow Wilson, is this great act of omission. So much of the conversation around this topic has been about the purpose of naming, renaming, and different forms of recognition. And I know Scott, he said that he sat on the board of trustees that gave the recommendation to ultimately um, keep the name, um, not only here at this, on this camp, on this building here, but as well as on the residential colleges and things of that nature. I just wanted to ask, and ask an overall question about um, the ways in which we recognize different figures historically and the purposes behind naming and renaming and kind of the ways in which you think that, you all think that these historical um, recognitions of different folks perpetuate a climate and a culture and an overall sort of um, remembrance of figures that may not be entirely accurate. Hmm. You're the expert. <laughs> yeah, right. Not quite an expert. But yeah, um, in my own work, I look very much at the ways in which this sort of naming of historical buildings and monuments and really how the American um, public landscape, some would say the commemorative landscape, has taken shape. 
And in the reality, what I'm finding is that the real contingent is that African Americans especially were never in the room for these decisions. So this is what a lot of the contingent is about. And it's also about the fact that uh, marginalized groups of people are not represented in the commemorative landscape in the United States at large. So we don't really see the equal amount of attention paid to figures from the African American community or Native American community and all these other communities. We're seeing more of this now, but when I study individual areas, when I look at places like Charleston, South Carolina, and I see that there are you know, statues of Calhoun, there's a statue of Confederate soldiers, there's a statue of Denmark Vesey, but it's not in the main historical downtown district of Charleston, right? So when these decisions are made, it does sort of perpetuate this idea that African Americans are not a part of a citizenship that actually deserves to be paid attention to. Um, I'm not sure what year, I guess it was in the 1930s when they named the Wilson School. So 36 they decided. 35. 35. Yes. So I imagine African Americans were not in any sort of number on campus at that point in time. So, I mean, this, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So, I mean, these decisions matter. And we see sort of this, you know, what we're seeing now is people saying, well, this is 2016. What does this mean today? You know, how are we really accounting for the ways in which we sort of name our heroes and commemorate our heroes? Because I think that that's what it's about. It's, we, we talk about Wilson being a complex man. But um, as Eric alluded to, we wouldn't have put his name on something if he didn't matter, if he was an ordinary man. So we can't just say this in the context of, you know, we can have a neutral position. To put his name on something implies that there is not a neutral position, right? It implies that he has done something deserving of honor. So how do we really reconcile that? And I think we're seeing these you know, chickens come home to roost in a larger, I think, I would say a larger youth, youth um, protest movement about really seeing you know, what are we gonna do about this commemorative landscape and how can we tie the fact that there's something named after a Confederate general to what's going on in our lives? I mean, some people directly confronted this by painting Black Lives Matter onto Confederate monuments throughout the South. Other people are saying, you know, where are the monuments to people who've contributed from other groups in this country? And it does, and I, you know, there's no simple answer, right? Because I think as a historian as well, um, my concern is too, you know, how do we continue to keep the history that this person was commemorated alive, mm -hmm. right? Um, we get concerned about these ideas of erasure, or at least I do, because I think that, you know, at a certain point, we need to know that at a point in time, this person was revered. And, and I, I think increasingly, I think you, you make a very good, I mean, history is an ongoing process. And indeed, there are now more people of color in the decision-making process, certainly on this campus, for example. And I think what, what the general feeling that I was picking up in, in what I had heard in the last several months is that perhaps it's more important for us to be adding rather than subtracting. Uh, and so instead of erasing, let's open up our eyes and do pay attention to that which we haven't looked at properly um, or that which we will soon be looking at. So. Questions, yeah. Hello. So uh, I like to sort of ask uh, someone who's not really, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, come from a science background and so history is more of a sort of a hobby or an interest for me. But I, I do think, I'm just curious how you, uh, you think of presidents, because I think for us, I think there are sort of two ways to think about a president. One is sort of as an executive in chief, right? There's a whole branch of government that needs to be run. And so in, in sort of that context, you can maybe be a little more sympathetic to sort of the math that I guess Scott was alluding to, where, you know, there are policies that need to be passed. So, you know, we need to be sort of calculating about what factions we can do to get what passed. So I think that's one way of thinking about presidents. But also just for a lot of people, I think, especially in the historical context, presidents serve as sort of uh, an embodiment of ideals of their time. And in, in that case, I'm, you know, it's, that sort of perspective is much less forgiving of the sort of math where you say, you know, oh, it's, it's not prudent right now to be again, or it's prudent right now to, you know, sort of be, to let the status quo continue. Mm -hmm. And I also know there's something unfair about, you know, judging a 1914 president by 2014 standards, but uh, as someone, as people who are, you know, study much more history than I do, I was curious about your perspective of sort of uh, what a president is and what it means. Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. Um, I mean, I think there's certainly a lot of different ways that we could think about the role of the president, the symbolic power of the presidency. Um, I personally 
you know, as someone who studies uh, African Americans in World War I, think about the role of the presidency in terms of commander in chief. Um, and I think Woodrow Wilson's uh, record as commander in chief, uh, as it pertained to, to African Americans, is a particularly egregious one. Um, but I, I also think that um, when we when we think about the the role of the presidency um, and Woodrow Wilson specifically, um, you know, I, I think it's it's not about judging him by 2016 standards. Um, it's about judging him as president of the United States from 1913 to 19. 19, uh, and what type of president he was. Uh, and in the context of those times, how his actions, um, his policies, uh, his management style as president of the United States was deeply problematic. Uh, and there were many people at that time who recognized how deeply problematic Woodrow Wilson was as, as president. So I don't think it's, it's projecting or being a historical uh, to acknowledge that there were aspects of Woodrow Wilson's uh, presidency uh, which we should rightly call into question uh, and think about the ways that we, um, that we, that we remember them. One of the things that really interests me about this debate is that I've seen it thrown out a number of times that um, Wilson put Brandeis on the court and so he's not an anti-Semite and, and, and that's, you know, that's great. Um, the, <laughs> you know, Jewish Americans in 1913 are 1% of the U.S. population. Um, the numbers game doesn't work. If the numbers game drives that decision, Brandeis doesn't wind up on the court. Part of what's going on is that Wilson's not an anti-Semite. Part of what's going on is that Northern Democrats want, uh, there are increasingly more Jews in New York and New Jersey, and, and that matters. Problem is that in the South, African Americans in some districts are 60, 70% of those districts. And so the numbers game can be played in all kinds of different ways and we can make these sort of justifications in all kinds of different ways. And I like the student's question, maybe the president should be bigger than that. Hmm. Yeah, I sort of think every movement has its time, or at least that's what Wilson felt. Uh, and you know, the, the African Americans kept getting sent to the back of the bus. And I think Jews uh, had priority. It was, you know, that was the first thing he could take a chance on. I think he genuinely wanted Brandeis on that court. I don't think it was a political decision. Brandeis had been an early advisor for Wilson. He really respected his mind. Most of the new freedom came from Brandeis. And this was the guy he wanted. It was, by the way, a very controversial appointment. And it was all about anti-Semitism. Uh, and, and, you know, we have, we have hearings of Supreme Court justices now, as you may read. Brandeis was the first of those public hearings to happen. And, they, and it was for one reason, that we don't want this Jew on the court, basically. It was veiled in other things. Um, and so, you know, I mean, when, when Wilson was, a, uh, was the president of this university, uh, he wanted to appoint one of the greatest historians in America to a professorship. He had even promised it to him, um, but the trustees wouldn't allow it because he was a Unitarian. Um, well, you know, after a couple of years, okay, a Unitarian could be okay, and Wilson even put a Jew on the, on the Princeton faculty. Whoa, my gosh, this was really something. So, you know, I mean... Well, Scott, so, yeah. so how is it that Wilson, and I'm, gen I'm genuinely asking this, yeah. how, do, how does he have the, the vision as well as the moral courage to appoint a Louis Brandeis, but to not imagine a place for African Americans as anything but second class citizens. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, to I, I think, <laughs> wrap yeah, my, my mind around and, that. And, and believe me, I've spent 15 years trying to wrap my head around all this too. Um, because he was by nature inclusionary. Uh, that's what he did at this, at this university. He was trying to open it up as much as possible. That then hit a big bump when, when it came to African Americans. Now, part, <laughs> part of that, part Very of that big was, bump, yeah. No, but I'm, <laughs> what? I said a bump is generous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, he crashed into a wall. Okay, um, yeah. 
but part, part of that was his own makeup, but I think a bit, bigger part of it was reading The Wind and what was out there. And I, I think, again, I think this is what he thought, that this country isn't ready to accept it and that all hell will break loose. And the irony is all hell did break loose uh, mm. by his doing nothing um, in, you know, from 16, mm -hmm. especially in 1919. Uh, Right, I'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible. I'm a, a graduate student in the history department. I study political history, so this has been a really, really fascinating conversation. I just wanted to make a very quick comment. Um, I think political historians um, in the past 30 years have really been trying to de-emphasize the personality of presidents mm -hmm. um, and more focus on policy outcomes. And it strikes me that there's sort of a cleavage here in the way that we're talking about Wilson. On the one hand, we're talking about whether or not he was personally bigoted. On the other, we're talking more about the actual people who were affected by um, essentially white supremacist policies. And I wanted to actually maybe broaden the conversation about those outcomes a little bit and talk about um, areas like foreign policy where the Treaty of Versailles, um, you know, based on Wilson, you know, based on this sort of broader white supremacy that undergirded American politics at the time, uh, really <coughs> disenfranchised effectively um, hundreds of millions of people across the world at a, at a moment of immense possibility when it comes to the restructuring of, of empires. And just more broadly make the gesture that these policies, you know, these attitudes, they matter globally. They don't just matter in the United States. And I think that's a part of the legacy that needs to be grappled with as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I think my question was partly stolen by Shea, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to overlap too much, but I'm really interested in the idea of, um, you call it historical memory. And uh, as a student here at the Woodrow Wilson School, something that came up a lot um, as these protests were happening was students saying that, you know, I never felt um, I never felt any sort of way, like I don't feel bad coming into this space. I didn't really know what an extreme racist he is. And I'm really interested in this idea of the consciousness and unconsciousness, um, and how does these different levels of consciousness change our historical memory? Um, is there more opportunity to reclaim? You spoke a little bit about how this conscious raising has an impact on, on moving away from caricatures of racism and moving towards these ideas of systematic racism, and it's not, a perfect question, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit towards that and, and how this consciousness changes mm. changes things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I'll answer that. Um, it's, you know, the idea of historical memory, and I always say that like memory is a phenomenon that has lots of power. Um, and it has power for a reason. And, you know, as someone that was a young student and my only sort of knowledge of Wilson, probably until I was undergrad, was of Wilson showing birth of a nation at the White House. And, you know, we talked a bit about how he did not say that quote, but the fact that he actually showed birth of a nation at the White House has remained a part of the historical memory of Wilson. Um, is sort of this conscious memory. And when, you know, when I would read about Wilson and race, that's the first thing mm -hmm. that would come up because Birth of a Nation is a film that reverberates throughout popular culture. And one of the things I look at a lot is the way which popular culture is a much larger phenomenon than the history that's written. Um, Thomas Dixon, who wrote The Klansman, which uh, Birth of a Nation is based on, um, really admired Wilson. And he admired- Classmates yeah. at Johns Hopkins. Yeah, and, right? he, and you know, they were acquaintances, and he used Wilson's own words from his scholarship mm -hmm. in slides in Birth of a Nation. So this is what has remained as part of this conscious memory of Wilson. And we can you know, try to debunk different elements of it, but I think it's worth paying attention to the fact and way, the ways in which memory sort of transitions from one generation to the next. And when we talk about people sort of getting this consciousness, right, we talk about African-American activists in particular historically, looking at the ways in which they're tying their current tradition into these symbol, symbolic gestures. I remember when the debate about the Confederate flag coming down in South Carolina, or the most recent one where it actually came down um, this past summer. And there were numerous people who said, you know, why does it matter, right? Who cares if we take down the Confederate flag? It's just this symbol. But you know, I saw beyond that that this symbol actually was, you know, the whole catalyst was the murders of nine African Americans in a church in downtown Charleston 
by white supremacists who use the Confederate flag. Um, the ways in which we value the, the memory of symbols and symbolism is sort of, you know, it's easy to say, and I think that this is the most important thing, is the, the systemic parts of this, right? The ways in which, you know, these manifest as self-esteem. Because I was one of the people, since I'm from South Carolina originally, that was like, okay, so now what, Nikki Haley? You know, <laughs> like, what are we gonna do in the state of South Carolina? But I think that a lot of people took, you know, notice of the fact that the Confederate flag has meant a particular thing to a number of people. So when we look at when we see names and monuments, you know, across the United States, what do these names draw up? Why do these memories matter for people? You know, they matter because they link it to their very real condition that they're facing currently. Do you want to well, the, the policy the, piece or, or you, something? You can else? do that. But yeah. I'll just say really briefly, the <laughs> you know it better than I do. The historical memory part needs also a phrase which is the usable past, mm -hmm. right? The way in which narratives from the past get used to justify things in the, in the, in the present or even in the future. So Wilson's on, you know, Wilson did not admire the KKK. He hated violence. He hated lynching. But what he did say about uh, in his textbook was that the KKK did what was necessary because the federal government had abrogated its responsibility to white Southerners. Mm -hmm. That's a usable past because it delegitimizes African Americans as mm. citizens. And you can follow that all the way to questions about the birth certificate of the president. Right? That's a usable <laughs> past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think to the, the question of Wilson and, and foreign policy, um, I mean, Wilson serves as, I think, an important entryway into thinking about American empire. Um, of the United States as an imperial nation. You know, he says in his uh, war declaration speech that United States, we have no territorial aspirations. You know, we're just, you know, in this for the good of the world. Well, the reality was that the United States was deeply immersed in the project of empire building, whether we're talking about uh, in the South Pacific. 1915, uh, Woodrow Wilson sends the United States Marines into to Haiti, right? This idea of the Western Hemisphere as being part of the American uh, Empire, um, and just his focus during the uh, Treaty of Versailles through the uh, effort to establish the League of Nations, how he doesn't really take uh, any type of firm stance uh, against the, uh, the the expansion um, uh, and, in some ways, the consolidation of European. Uh, empire, uh, especially uh, in Africa. I mean, how you know you have someone like uh, Du Bois who recognizes from the start uh, that World War One is ostensibly about empire building, this kind of mad dash for uh, human and material resources in Africa and other parts of uh, the Black world. Uh, Woodrow Wilson does nothing to uh, really kind of impede that uh, that uh, process. So. Uh, I certainly think that you know he is uh, uh, worthy uh, of, of uh, sustained attention in that area, um, and at the same time thinking about how he inspires uh, a, a growing movement of anti-colonial activism as well. Uh, you may be familiar with Erez Manella's book, The Wilsonian Moment, how uh, not just African Americans uh, but other colonized uh, uh, peoples of color across uh, the world latch on to. Uh, his notion of self-determination uh, and begin to build uh, an anti-colonial movement that uh, kind of fully actualizes itself by the 1950s uh, and 60s. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm a first year student here at the Woodrow Wilson School. And when this conversation first started, I'll tell you, Scott, I, I was kind of indifferent to the whole thing. Um, but as I've listened to you contextualize Woodrow Wilson and, and his legacy, I'm, I'm really disappointed that the university kept his, his name because I think Princeton's one of the greatest places on earth and great places should be named after great people and great people fight for the powerless and not just the powerful. So I'm really actually disappointed that, that, that they kept the name. And, and the final thing I would say is that several times you've invoked the name of the great Booker T. Washington. Huh. And paramount to Booker T. Washington's program was economic equality and determination for black people. And that's absolutely antithetical to the things that Woodrow Wilson did in terms of policy uh, for black folks and their economic equality. So I would just, as you contextualize and situate Woodrow Wilson in a historical context, I don't think utilizing the name of Booker T. Washington is an apt use uh, of a historical figure for that. Well, I, I use him merely to show that 
while we talk a lot about the uh, Du Boises and Trotters and Johnsons, uh, there was this other greater voice at the moment, at the moment, things were really changing. And that's the only reason I bring them up. And when you read Booker T. Washington today, it's, o it's almost ridiculous. But boy, in 1895, Booker T. Washington made a lot of sense to, to most Americans, I think, certainly most of white America, and I think a large segment of black America. As for the naming, and I'm speaking just as myself here, um, and I, I hope you'll read more about this, but Woodrow Wilson did not just change this university, but he developed an entire structure for college education that most colleges to this day around the country still employ. Um, you know, I mean, we all talk about the preceptorial system, and you know, but Wilson introduced having majors, having electives, having distribution requirements, all, all this, and really rejigged this entire college that then became um, a national and even international model. On top of that, in this college, he was then trying to break down the very exclusive social system that existed here. Uh, and he really was trying to get rid of the clubs, or at least to weaken them, uh, because he thought it was making the college experience uh, less equal, less inviting for too many people. Um, you know, the, the very argument that African American students are making on this campus today. Again, in Wilson's mind, it's not their turn yet. So that's that. But all that being said, this man, you know, there were five or six um, educational giants in higher education in the late 18th, early, or yes, uh, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And Wilson, I think you'll find, is the most supreme of all of them. And then when it comes to this place in particular, what Woodrow Wilson did in public and international affairs, how Woodrow Wilson went off to, to Paris for the treaty and really, really put the United States on the, on the world map front and center and went in with an extremely unselfish agenda. He did not want territory. He did not want money. He really went in there with an idea and he really went in with these ideas of self-determination and spreading democracy and so forth. And this was a big, new, international idea, and he ultimately laid his life on the line for it. And so, because he was a man of not just big ideas, but of ideals, I think that's why, um, on balance, uh, those things seemed extremely significant and seemed worthy enough for even those people who on this campus to this day feel less than, who feel left out. I think they, I mean, this is easy for me to say because I don't have to deal with it, but I would like to feel that one day they will walk into this building and feel aspirational in part because of what Woodrow Wilson put out there. Thank you. Oh, well. So it is now six o'clock, but this conversation can continue. So I want to invite you all to the reception downstairs for our exhibits. I'd like to highlight a few things. One is if you want to read more on the books that our, three of our panelists have done, and we'll have Ashley back when she has her book done. We have a book signing no uh, downstairs. No Two, all of our panelists will be downstairs if you have further questions. And please join me in thanking the panels for a fact. Oh, I've been, I've got two chapters in. So. Oh, oh, so you're, you're welcome, right? Yeah, yeah, so, you know. I'm glad you were here. Hi.